God is just so faithful, you know, you, uh, and sometimes it can almost be diminished to a cliche, you know, where we just walk around and say, God is faithful, God is faithful, God is faithful, but it's situations and moments and even songs like this that reawaken us to that incredible truth that he really is faithful. It's not just a cliche, it is truth. Would you pray with me? Father, this morning as we turn to the truth of your word, your word says about your word that it is living and it is active and it is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both bone and marrow, and is even able to judge the very thoughts and intentions of the human heart, and there is no creature hidden from your sight, but all of us are laid bare before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. And so, Father, this morning we turn to the greatness of Your truth, And in mercy, we ask you to change our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. So, we turn to the Sermon on the Mount today in Matthew chapter 5, verses 33 through 42. I was going to attempt initially to get through the rest of the chapter. Uh, didn't quite get there, and I realized that we do have potluck today, so probably not a good idea if I kept you in here till 2 o'clock. So we will stop at verse 42 today, and then we'll, Lord willing, finish out the chapter next week. But if you would like to read along with me in your Bibles or follow along on the screen behind me, our text for today is Matthew 5. 33 through 42, and it says this in the New American Standard Translation. Jesus speaking says, Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything beyond this is of evil. And you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Verse 42 says, give to him who asks of you and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So it should come as no surprise to the child of God who is walking in covenant relationship with the Lord through Jesus Christ that the moral expectations of the kingdom of heaven are much different than the moral expectations of the world. In fact, one could safely say the moral expectations of the world stand in sharp contrast and shocking opposition to those of the kingdom of heaven. For the citizen of heaven, the standard expected is that of holiness, without which no one will see God, as Hebrews tells us. For the citizen of heaven, the standard expected is that of godliness, which is gained through the means of a disciplined life. For the citizen of heaven, the standard expected is that of righteousness, which is reflected in Jesus' statement that we'll get to next week, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That is 
radically different from the world. So it shouldn't take long for a person who has been converted as a Christian to realize that God's kingdom holds its citizens to a much higher standard than that of the world. And when pressed further as to what exactly this higher standard looks like, God shows us His law. Sometimes our calling to such a high standard of holiness and godliness and righteousness expressed in God's law can confuse how we understand our salvation and the new life that we live in Christ. And so therefore, I'm grateful that for the last several weeks, our journey through the Sermon on the Mount has allowed me several opportunities to be able to teach on this somewhat complex subject of law. I've presented several different angles using several different paths given in Scripture to hopefully lead us into a greater understanding of the connection between law and gospel. And today, as we continue in the Sermon on the Mount, I am continuing to be grateful as we take another opportunity to submit to you again uh, uh, another angle which shows this connection between law and gospel. And so before we get to Matthew and exegete the passages that we've just read, we'll spend a few minutes in Romans regarding the law. So beginning in Romans 3, we find the tension between God's law and sinful man is presented pretty clearly to us. Romans 3, 19 through 20. The Apostle Paul says this, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed, and all the world may become accountable to God. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. So under God's law, at whatever point that it speaks to in our lives, it has the effect of silencing the mouth of every person as it brings the entire world into accountability before God. That is what the law does for sinful creatures. And ultimately, this accountability before God condemns the entire world as no flesh is able to be justified before His holy, righteous face. Why is this? Because, as Paul says here, through the law, as it is held up to our lives, it reveals the knowledge of sin, and this in every person. Under the law, every mouth is closed, every person is accountable, and no one is justified. That is the tension we live in As fallen creatures, God's holy, righteous law and our unclean filthiness stained by sin. And we stand condemned because of it. But mankind has not been left to despair under the weight of this great tension because Romans goes on, thankfully so, in the next verses, verses 21 through 24 saying, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all those who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus." Those are good words, my friends. These verses point to an alternative reality, a reality with great hope. Apart from the law, it says, but yet being witnessed by the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested in Jesus Christ. And when this manifestation of righteousness is believed and apprehended through faith, 
all who have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God without distinction are justified and are gifted with redemption and this by grace. Furthermore, Romans goes on to provide the details of how such an incredible thing can truly happen, right? So again, you know, we talk about redemption and it's not, it's not a cliche, right? I mean, this is reality. This is truth. And may God peel away the scales of our heart so that we can feel it. So furthermore, Romans goes on to provide the details of how this miracle can happen in our lives. That sinners such as us can be redeemed. Romans 3, 25 and 26. This Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance or patience of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So, so how were those previously unjustified with closed mouth before God because of lawlessness all of a sudden find themselves redeemed in the righteousness of Christ? It is, as it says here, through his sacrifice of blood publicly displayed for all to see. For as Hebrews declares, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And so we see this in the prophet Isaiah as we read how the father was pleased to crush the son and put him to grief on the cross as a guilt offering for our sins. We read about how Christ became our propitiation, the sacrificial appeasement satisfying the wrath of God against us. We read about how Jesus' blood was spilled to the point of death so that a new covenant could be established by grace. We read about the Son's suffering, which demonstrates His righteousness as God patiently, with great forbearance, passed over the sins of our past. And as a result, wonder of wonders, in this present time in which we now stand before God blameless, Christ has become for us both just and the justifier of those who have faith in Him. Sin has been punished on our behalf. Divine justice has been served according to the just demands of the righteous requirement of the law. And the one in whom the demands of the law have been met, this very self-same one is also he who justifies. Jesus Christ is both the just and the justifier demonstrating perfect righteousness in us by faith. So therefore, in Christ, by His blood, we are redeemed. Having been forgiven. Having been made righteous forever. So, what now? Right? We're redeemed. We're saved. We're justified what now? Or maybe more specifically, in this discussion that we're having right now, what role does law play in the life of the Christian? We understand what the law has done up to this point. It's closed our mouth. It has made us accountable to the judgment of God. But what now? We've been justified. We've been saved. We've been redeemed. We've been set free. Is the law to be forgotten? Is it to be annulled? Is it to be removed? Romans goes on to give us the answer. Romans 3, 27 through 31. After saying all this, Paul says, Well, where then is boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? Of works? No, but by a law of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. 
Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles also. Since indeed God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith is one. And here is the point. Do we then nullify the law through faith? Paul says emphatically with an exclamation point, may it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Paul summarizes what he has just explained in detail by saying Christianity maintains that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law, right? We've already said that. This is a summary statement. And this applies equally, he says, to both Jew and Gentile, to those who are of the circumcision and to those who are of the uncircumcision. And now, just as a Side note, this is important because there are voices today who teach that God has two separate plans of salvation, that there's a plan of salvation for the Jews based on works of the Old Covenant, and there's one for Gentiles based on faith in Christ through a New Covenant, right? And they teach that there, there's two plans of salvation of God. But Scripture is clear at this point, very, very clear, that there is only one plan of salvation for all people, no matter what a person's ethnic background may be. And that plan is faith in the Son of God, who is, Jesus said, the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except for through Him. That is very, very important for us to understand. It's a complete side note from where we're going this morning, but it was mentioned, so I mention it too. So back in our progression of the text, Paul asks the million-dollar question, which makes our point, does faith in Christ nullify the law of God? His answer is, may it never be. Instead, on the contrary, as Christians, living by faith in the one who is both just and justifier, we establish the law. And this is where it gets difficult. Because it's at this point of our understanding of the law that we, we kind of stand on this razor's edge. Right? For some they fall off in the direction of legalism and Judaism. At one level, they may embrace Christ's work of salvation, but they very quickly depart from orthodoxy because they see Christ as only a stepping stone of God's help that will enable them to now perform the works of the law, procuring their own salvation through their own works. It's a self-defeating argument, philosophy at best, and it is anathema, cursed at worst. And it falls under the condemnation of Scripture over and over and over again, most notably maybe in the letter to the Galatians. One example, Galatians 5, 2 through 4 says this, Behold, I, Paul, say to you, right, he's talking to the Judaizers, the legalists, who say that Jesus is just a, a grace of help so that now we can go and perform the law and therefore we can be saved instead of Christ himself being salvation, right? The, the Judaizers, the legalists. And so Paul comes along, writes this letter, and he says, I say to you that if you receive circumcision, the works of the law, for your righteousness and justification, <clears throat> Christ will be of no benefit to you. And I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law, right? You can't just keep the circumcision, which testifies of the covenant, the old covenant, right? I mean, if you're going to embrace that part of the law, you've got to embrace it all for your justification, which no one can do, but yet many try. And then he goes on and makes this very scary statement. If this is you, if you are... If you are trying to be justified through your own attempts at the works of the law, then this is your lot. You have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, and you have fallen from grace. These are the legalists and Judaizers. They fall off the razor's edge this way, into legalism. 
and to their own ability to justify themselves. But others fall off the razor's edge on the other side, which leads back to a life of lawlessness and fleshly indulgence and bondage. These are the antinomians, those who are against the law, who resist any kind of ongoing standard of the moral perfection contained in the law. Everything is explained away by grace with no expectation of real transformation or genuine pursuits of holiness or, as we mentioned earlier, the discipline which leads to godliness. And so this too, antinomianism against the law, where we just get rid of the whole shebang, <laughs> that's a good word, this too is a severe error and is condemned by Scripture, by Jesus himself in this example from Matthew 7, 21. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Right? And he says, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Right? I mean, look at all that stuff, Jesus. And Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice what? Lawlessness. Doesn't matter what kind of hocus pocus you've put on. You're lawless. Proves that I do not know you. So on the one side, we have graceless, legalistic Judaizers seeking to be justified before God by works of the law. And on the other side, we have fleshy, cheap grace antinomians who are Christian in name only because their lawlessness separates them from Christ. That's the razor's edge that we're at. But instead of the errors, potential errors of these two ways, Romans gives us a clear path forward as we walk this razor's edge of what do we do with the law. Romans 6, 12 through 14, Paul says this, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But instead, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, Christian, for you are not under law, but you are under grace. Remember? So speaking to the church, to believers, those who have been redeemed by faith in Christ, Paul says, Christian, do not let sin reign in your body by obeying its lusts and desires. And do not continue presenting the members of your bodies to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. But instead, Christian, continually present yourselves to God as those who are now alive from the dead. Walk in this newness of life which the Spirit has given you. In sin we were dead, but now in Christ, by His Spirit, we are alive forevermore. Therefore, keep presenting ourselves to God as living creatures redeemed from the pit. We keep submitting the members of our body, our arms, our legs, our eyes, our mouth, and so on and so forth as instruments of righteousness to the Lord who redeemed us. And so the next big question in this logical progression of thought should be, well, how? How do I know if I'm doing this, right? How do I know if I am allowing sin to reign in my body or, or if on the other hand I'm, I really am using my members as instruments of righteousness to the glory of God alone? I mean, how do I, how do I know? The answer is God's Holy Spirit working through the law. How do I know if my tongue is an instrument of righteousness or unrighteousness? Do I just give it the old college try and hope for the best on judgment day? 
No, we read the truth of God's word, which is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of bone and marrow, judging the very thoughts and intentions of the heart as the Holy Spirit either convicts us or commends us. And so, as Paul points out, we are not under law, but grace as it applies to salvation and justification, but the standard, the moral standard of the law still works in us as we walk by the Spirit and not according to the flesh. We could say so much about this, and we're in Matthew, so it's like, maybe we'll we'll leave it at this, right? So some of some of the greatest words probably ever spoken to mankind from the Bible is in Romans chapter 8. And Romans 8, 1 through 5 gives us, I think this, what we've just talked about, right? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? The condemnation which came by the law, which closed our mouth, made us accountable to the judgment of God in Christ is gone. No more condemnation. We live by grace through faith in Christ. And he goes on to say, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Right? The problem wasn't that the law was weak. The problem was that our flesh was weak when presented with the law, it exposed our sin, our, our weak nature. And so, because of that, God, God did what the law could not do. And what was that? He sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. And so without going too much further, I'll just wrap it up in verses 12 through 14, which which is our calling. This This is where we now live. So then, brethren, we are under obligation. What is that obligation? He goes on to say, not to the flesh, We're not under obligation to the flesh to keep sinning, but rather instead we're under obligation to live according to the Spirit. As he goes on to say here, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God receiving the adoption of the kingdom. And the law is very important in all of that. In these verses which explain our path of salvation, I hope you notice the role that God's law has played throughout the whole thing. In fallen humanity, the law reveals our lawlessness and condemns us before God as being unrighteous. But in Christ, the law reveals something different. It reveals the righteousness of God as Jesus fulfilled the law perfectly. And so by faith, that righteousness is credited to the believer as our sins are forgiven. By grace, we have been saved. But just because we are now under grace does not mean that our flesh is allowed to roam free. Our flesh is not allowed to indulge in whatever sinful passion it may desire, leading us back into slavery and death and bondage and those sorts of things. Instead, we are now under obligation, as Paul says, to live by the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who empowers us to put to death the deeds of the flesh and all unrighteousness that it would try to produce. In this, the commandments of the Lord And the moral standards of the law remain critically important as the Spirit works mightily in us for sanctification 
and confirming the assurance of our adoption. So as Christians, right, summary statement, as Christians, we are neither legalists and Judaizers seeking to be justified by law, nor are we antinomians whereby we ignore the law, but instead we recognize it as the good works of God's kingdom, which all true citizens pursue and walk in by faith. And I know that's a lot. I, I, uh, I don't apologize for it, but I, I recognize that it is a lot. But hopefully some of that has stuck, because now we're going to return back to the Sermon on the Mount, and hopefully what I've just said will inform what Jesus is now saying. So with that, let's turn back to Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, in verse 33. Verse 33, Jesus states the first of two commands that we'll look at today, saying, Again, you have heard that the ancients were told, You shall not make false vows, but shall fulfill your vows to the Lord. This verse is rather straightforward and finds its origin in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy. So if we turn to Deuteronomy 23, 21 through 23, we find the foundation of what Jesus said in this. That when you make a vow to the Lord your God, you shall not delay to pay it, for it would be sin in you, and the Lord your God will surely require it of you. However, if you refrain from vowing, it would not be sin in you, and you shall be careful to perform what goes out from your lips, just as you have voluntarily vowed to the Lord your God what you have promised." And so in these verses, the law of God is explaining to us the high responsibility of keeping our promises to God. If we make a promise to the Lord, and when the opportunity presents itself to us for us to be able to fulfill that promise, we must not delay in keeping our vow. If a promise is made to God, we must be careful to do what our lips have said. If we do delay, if its fulfillment is postponed, put off, or possibly neglected altogether, Scripture is clear that this is sin, and we become accountable before God. In Jesus' words, he calls vows made without follow-through false vows, which is a very close cousin to lying. And therefore, the law is stating if we promise to do something, especially if that promise is to the Lord, then we must make sure to follow through with the utmost highest of integrity. So that's the statement of the command. In the following verses, Jesus then expands and clarifies the command by saying this in verses 34 through 36. But I say to you, make no oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is the footstool of his feet, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Nor shall you make an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. And the clarification is that when a vow or a promise is made, the temptation for us may be to add an oath to it. Right? By heaven, I promise to do this. By the earth, I promise to do that. As sure as the city of Jerusalem, I will make this happen. As sure as the color of the hair on my head, I will make that happen. Right? It's a promise with an oath attached to it, giving it assurance or attempting to give it credibility. Kind of acts as a guarantee. I make this promise and I swear by earth, that it will happen. Maybe if we turn to our friends, friends, the scribes and Pharisees, we can maybe understand a little bit further what this practice looked like in Jesus' time. Matthew 23, 16 through 21, Jesus is calling out the scribes and Pharisees, and he says to them, Woe to you, blind guides, who say, 
Whoever swears by the temple, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the gold of the temple is obligated. You fools and blind men, which is more important? The gold or the temple that sanctified the gold? And whoever swears by the altar, that is nothing. But whoever swears by the offering on it, he is obligated. You blind men, which is more important? The offering or the altar that sanctifies the offering? Therefore, whoever swears by the altar swears both by the altar and by everything on it. And whoever swears by the temple swears both by the temple and by him who dwells within it. And so we see this practice of the scribes and Pharisees, and most likely it was um, probably pretty prominent in much of Jewish culture at this time, but, but specifically the practice of the scribes and Pharisees in making promises was to swear oaths along with it. That by certain religious things that promise will be more solid, more substantial. It'll have more integrity of follow-through, right? And for them, it was almost a game of escalating competition. Oh, I see you swear by the temple? Well, I swear by the gold of the temple. Therefore, my promise must be more noble than yours. Or you swear by the altar? Psh, that's nothing. I swore by the oath of the offering which is placed on the altar. Therefore, my promise carries greater weight. And we see this as kind of this competition thing. Who can give the, the, the greater oath along with their promise? And so to this, Jesus not only declares their oaths to be empty and their promises hypocrisy, but he says you're blind in the whole thing. So that just, I don't want to go any further with that, but hopefully that gives us a picture of what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5 regarding promises that have oaths attached to them. Because Jesus says, you're not supposed to do this. You're not supposed to add oaths to your promises. As true citizens of the kingdom, this is not how we act. So how are we to act? Well, Jesus gives us the answer in verse 37, this great principle of the kingdom. He says, instead, let your statement be yes, yes, or no, no, and anything beyond that is evil, right? So as redeemed, transformed, spirit-filled Christians, let our promises be established merely upon the integrity of our word. In our culture, it seems as if the days of a person's yes being yes and his no being no have been lost. Rarely are promises sealed with a handshake based on character and integrity. Our society has fallen so far in this area. I can remember when I had my drywall business where this was a constant problem. Because of the absence of integrity, everything had to be backed up in writing. And the greater the legal precision in the writing, the better. The bid had to be in writing. The scope of work had to be in writing. Presentation of contractor's insurance had to be given in writing. Deadlines for phase completions had to be in writing. Dates for payout had to be in writing. Change orders had to be in writing. And on and on and on and on it went. Very, very rarely on a job contracted was it completed just merely by a handshake. My yes is yes. We will do the work and uh, that should be good enough. Always they demanded more, something in writing, something legal. We can't trust your word. But you know, in that, there was one contractor whom we dealt with quite often that wasn't like that. He would call me with a job. I would give him my price, usually over the phone. He would say, come do the work. We would do the work and get paid for it, and that was that. No forms, no proof of insurances, 
No written change order statements, just a word given that the job would be done and payment would be received. And you know what the difference was with this contractor? He was a Christian, and he lived by this principle. Let your yes be yes, and your no be no. And I think this is the point which Jesus is making. As Christians, as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, let our yeses be yeses and our noes be noes. Let the promises that we make be based on our Christian honesty and integrity before the Lord. And if anyone can be known by truthfulness, shouldn't it be the Christians? If anyone can be trusted in a promise, it absolutely should be God's people. And so as we live out our lives in this difficult world, may we reflect the nature of the kingdom in which our yes is yes and our no is no with no mediating oaths necessary other than maybe, hey, we're Christian and that's just how we live. Amen? Second commandment of the law which Jesus gives picks up in verse 38 of Matthew. And this one has to do with vengeance. Jesus says this, Verse 38, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And so again, we have this statement of command which comes from the Old Testament law. And if we dig a little bit, we find this in Leviticus 24, 17 through 20, whereby it says, if a man takes the life of any human being, he shall surely be put to death. The one who takes the life of an animal shall make it good life for life. If a man injures his neighbor, just as he has done, so it shall be done to him. And here it is, fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, just as he has injured a man, so it shall be inflicted on him. All right, so the principle is fairly straightforward. If an injustice has been done, then to right the wrong, a payment of equal worth is required. If the life of a man is taken, for example, then the life of the one who took it shall be forfeit. If the life of an animal is taken, such as maybe your your neighbor's livestock, then the life of the animal shall be repaid. Or if injury is done to a neighbor, then the injury is to be repaid. And then there is the part which Jesus quoted, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, equal payment retribution but Leviticus doesn't give us the whole picture we also need to include Deuteronomy 19 16 through 21 which talks about the context in which this happens and that context is that it is to be done before an assembly of priests and judges who are acting on behalf of the Lord so Deuteronomy 19 16 through 21 is very important If a malicious witness rises up against a man to accuse him of wrongdoing, then both the men who have the dispute shall stand before the Lord, which is before the priests and judges who will be in office in those days. The judges shall investigate thoroughly, and if the witness is a false witness and he has accused his brother falsely, then you shall do to him just as he had intended to do to his brother. Thus you shall purge the evil from among you. The rest will hear and be afraid, right? They won't go around, you know, with false accusations anymore. And they'll never again do such an evil thing among you. And thus you shall not show pity. And here it is again, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. So an accusation of wrongdoing is is put forward and it is to be witnessed and assessed before the priests and judges who are acting as representatives of the law. And that is very, very important into understanding what Jesus is saying here. The role of these priests and judges is to determine whether the crime has truly taken place or not. And if so, then they hand down the proper penalty. 
in the scenario of Deuteronomy, it says here that the accuser is found to be false. He's lying. And so his punishment is to do to him as he has intended to do to his brother, life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and so on. And so whatever that looks like, how do you pay back somebody who has defamed and slandered your name? I'm not sure, you know, but that's beside the point. And so this law has, has to do with getting justice and receiving back what was lost. So after stating this command of the law, Jesus then goes further to clarify God's intention behind the law and to reinforce what is expected. And this is typically the part that we don't like, Matthew 5, 39 through 42. But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him too. Give to him who asks you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. So Jesus emphasizes in this command what seems to be at first glance a blind eye to what the law says. Right? He says, do not resist an evil person. If he slaps you on your right cheek, offer him the left cheek as well. If he wants to sue you in order to take your shirt, let him have your coat also. If a Roman soldier presses you into service and forces you to carry his goods for a mile, which was allowable in this time under Roman rule, go with him two miles. And so as I said, it seems as if Jesus is ignoring the law's provision for justice. Does Jesus not care about justice? Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Come on, Jesus. That's what it seems. But not always as it seems. Jesus is not ignoring justice. But rather instead, he is reaffirming the proper procedure for justice by emphasizing a prohibition against personal vengeance, as well as emphasizing the importance of Christian generosity in the face of injustice. In Jesus' time, as well as in our time, vengeance and revenge are big problems, huge problems. Go on Facebook, you find it all over the place. We love the idea of eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But that is only part of the command. The rest of the command is that the retribution for an eye for an eye is handed down from God, not from the person who lost the eye. Remember in Deuteronomy that for the justice of an eye for an eye to be carried out in a way that honors God, the issue needs to be heard before the priests and the judges who are acting in God's place. But the problem in our time is that we have very little faith that God can be trusted with our injustice. Right? Honest? We need to take matters into our own hands because, hey, we can't wait around for God to do something. I need my eye back. And so to make matters worse, we, we, even, we watch movies where street-level justice is glorified. Right? Such and such a person is wronged, and so he becomes this vigilante figure, and he seeks his own justice, and, and we pay good money to be entertained by it. But that's not what Scripture teaches. Jesus says the kingdom doesn't operate that way. God is the one who repays injustice. And he does so according to the means that he has ordained, and in the timing in which he calls perfect. So, Scripture harmonizes with this over and over. We could spend a lot of time on this. This isn't some obscure law that only shows up in the Bible once. It's all over the place. But let me take you one place. 
Romans 12, 17 through 21. The apostle says, never, and never in Greek means never, <laughs> never pay back evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men, God's justice. And if possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And if that means you need my coat, have it. Never, and again, never in Greek means never, <laughs> never take your own revenge, beloved. So does God not care about justice? No, because we need to keep reading. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but rather instead leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. So what should we do? Paul goes on. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. And if he's thirsty, give him a drink of water. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is so parallel with what Jesus is saying in Matthew 5. God is not against justice. Instead, what is being taught is that our faith and trust must be completely in the Lord who repays in perfect measure and at the perfect time. Our place as citizens of the kingdom, as stated here in Romans and also by Jesus in Matthew, is to be generous in the face of injustice. Completely different than what the world thinks. Completely different than how the devil wants you to respond. He doesn't want you to respond with faith and generosity when you've been wronged. He wants you to get mad. He wants you to destroy relationships. He wants you to get angry and commit murder. Instead, God says, if our enemy is hungry, feed him. Fix him a nice steak, medium rare. If our enemy is thirsty, give him a drink of water with lots of ice cubes in it. It's nice and cold and refreshing. If our enemy slaps us on our right cheek, we'll give him the left too. And if that's not enough, well, here's the right one again. If our enemy takes our shirt, then we give him our coat and, and our whole wardrobe if necessary. Radical. Kingdom. It is so important for us to see the subject of justice through the lens of faith. If we don't, not only are we going to miss kingdom expectations for our lives, but we're going to land in all kinds of trouble. If we approach injustice from the perspective of, God, you're probably not going to do anything about this, so it's up to me to figure this out, to get my eye back, get my tooth back. Not only are we faithless, but it is going to open up so many doors of trouble. <laughs> and so maybe to help us in this, as we are being humbled right now, we can turn to Jesus as our example. First Peter chapter 2. Peter says, church, you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And here it is. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats. And so what did he do? He kept entrusting himself to God who judges righteously. 
if anyone in the history of the world did not deserve the evil and the injustice that he experienced, it was Jesus Christ, right? But the sinless, deceitless Son of God willingly suffered the greatest injustice this world has ever produced. And so how did he respond? (laughs) With silence. He uttered no threats. He did not return reviling for reviling. But in this, Peter says, he kept entrusting himself to God who judges righteously. Right? And Jesus even said this. Look, I, I could call legions of angels down and you know, wipe out the whole Roman Empire. But he didn't do that. Instead, he kept entrusting himself in this injustice on the cross to the Father. And in the Father's time and in the Father's righteousness, justice will come. For those who are in Christ, justice will pass. We have been redeemed. For those upon whom Christ is rejected, the eternal wrath of God remains. It's called Judgment Day. God is absolutely concerned about justice. And so we may not like it very much, but Peter says here in verse 21 that we have been called to this very same purpose, that Christ is our example in times of unfair suffering. And so much more can be said about this. Um, we're talking a lot about it in Wednesday night, just a plug for our adult class as we walk through the life of David, who experienced this over and over again, um, but yet responded with faith most of the time but in conclusion this morning as i'm sure everyone is getting hungry it is important for us to notice something very significant about god's kingdom which is what the sermon on the mount is teaching us this is what the kingdom looks like so what does it look like well it looks that god has called us to a very high moral standard that is completely different than what the world asks for And so with this, the idea that if we become Christians, then life is going to be easy because, you know, we can do whatever we want is just absolutely not true. Being a Christian is hard. In fact, it's impossible without the Holy Spirit and the grace of Christ, right? The standards of righteousness are infinitely high. The moral expectations of God are perfection. But in this, two things must always, always, always be remembered. First, in Christ, we are under grace, not law. We are justified by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, never by the works of the law. Second, as Christians, as we embark boldly onto the waters of God's kingdom, living by the power of the Holy Spirit, by God's grace and design, our lives will obviously stand out as a stark witness to the world around us. And this is really where I want to leave you with today. Maybe help us to feel our calling even more that we've been called to this high standard. And in this, I'm reminded of the story of the pilgrims, that as they were persecuted and they were chased out of England and chased into the Dutch lands before setting sail to the New World, they were persecuted from town to town to town. But in that, people started to take notice that these Puritans were different in a good way. They were respectful in ways that others weren't, including other Christians. They were honest. They showed integrity in their promises. They treated their families with great honor, including the women and children, which was rare in those days. They showed a level of morality that even other Christians admired. 
They were generous even when wronged. You can read about it in the uh, biography of their pastor, John Robinson. Great story. And so as a result, though the state continued to persecute them along religious lines, the local people in the communities where they lived started to hold them in very high regard. These Christians, these Puritan Christians are something special. They are good for our community. They represent principles that are different than the world. And so I'll just leave you with this. It is my belief from what I see in Scripture, and especially in the Sermon on the Mount, that God's people have been called to stand out as a people who live by greater principles. Amen? And we live in a time when we need a moral and spiritual reformation like no other. But the kind of action which will reform our community and reform our country and reform our world, Lord willing, isn't of the violent kind produced by the revolutionaries of this world. Instead, the kind of action which will reform our world will be through the good works of a people who are so secure in the grace of Christ that they're unafraid to walk as slaves of righteousness in the power of the Holy Spirit, even when it's unpopular to do so. Which therefore leads us into persecution, which is next week. So worship team, would you come? This morning we want to take a moment of reflection during this next song and uh, then we'll celebrate communion. So please take a few moments and uh, allow yourselves to be silent before the Lord. Allow the Lord to sift you, to search you. And uh, if there be sin, if there be transgression, this is the time for confession. And after the confession between you and the Lord has been made, please come and get your communion elements, and we'll celebrate the grace of Christ together. Amen.